our call to worship this morning uh, comes from the Book of Common Prayer. It's a prayer, and I invite you to pray it with me. Oh God, you so love the world as to give your only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Grant to us this precious gift of faith, that we may know that the Son of God is come, and may have power to overcome the world and gain a blessed immortality. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Good morning and welcome to Water's Edge Church Online. My name is Tara Dodge. I'm the Director of Music here at the church, and we are excited and glad that you are joining us this morning. If you have not heard the exciting news yet, next Sunday we will be opening back up live, and we have a 9 o'clock traditional service or an 11 o'clock contemporary service that you can join us, or we will still have our services available online like we have. So I hope that you are able to worship with us in one of those ways next Sunday, and I ask that you be praying for the people that are preparing and who are planning to attend, um, that everything just goes smoothly and without any complications and any health issues. So praise Jesus that we're going to be back together again next Sunday. For this morning, I would like to open us up in prayer, and then we're going to start our service in song. Lord God, you are great. You are mighty, Lord. You are loving. You are faithful. You are gracious, Father. And I hope that none of these things go unnoticed this morning as we worship in song and in prayer, as we hear your word through scripture, Lord God, as we connect together as a church family. Lord, let us see all that you are clearly today. Let this service be glorifying to your name. Let hearts be changed. Let minds and bodies and spirits be renewed. And Lord God, bring us safely together next Sunday. I pray all of this in your son's name. Amen.
Hey everyone, I'm glad that you could join us this month as our elementary students are going to be exploring some culinary creations and edible experiments. That's right, it's going to be a bake-off in our curriculum videos, which by the way, you can find on our YouTube channel. Um, our hosts this month are going to take us on some tasty challenges as they find out what it means to have patience. You know, I know it can be super hard to wait for something when you want it right now. And that's why you've got to sprinkle in some patience, especially when you bake. Let me ask you, do you just dump a whole bunch of ingredients into a bowl at random, like a little bit of this and a little bit of that? Or do you actually have to measure everything out very carefully? You know, it is important to get the measurements just right when you bake. And that does take some patience. Today, we have a great story from the Bible about a guy named Simeon. Simeon is known for... Waiting for patience. What was Simeon waiting for? Well... Let's find out. So, please don't interrupt. Interrupt what exactly? I've been feeling very impatient lately. I think it's because we live in a world where I can get most anything I want instantly. I check my phone for social media updates every four seconds. Sometimes I can watch a show on TV at the same time I'm watching a show on my laptop. At night, when I'm asleep, I listen to music so I don't have to hear the deafening roar of silence. So I'm trying to prove that I don't have to constantly be doing something to entertain myself. By? By doing the most boring thing I could think of. Watching paint dry. Oh, oh. Wait a minute. This isn't the part of the wall I painted. Oh, man. Worth the wait. Hey, guys. Hey, Kellen. What are we talking about today? Well, today we are talking about waiting. And waiting. And waiting. And to help us through those long, long waits, we've got the So-and-So Show Players. God's people knew a lot about waiting. For hundreds of years, they had been waiting for God to send them a Savior or a Messiah like he promised. One of God's people, a man named Simeon, lived in Jerusalem. He was a good and godly man, and he was told by the Holy Spirit that he would see the Messiah with his own eyes sometime before he died. I will? I gotta get to the temple. Now, we can only imagine how Simeon felt when the Holy Spirit told him that he would see the Messiah. He was probably very excited. Yo, Simeon, what's going on, bro? Who are you looking for? The Holy Spirit told me that I would see the Messiah with my own eyes. What? what? The Holy Spirit said you would see the Messiah today? Well, he didn't say today exactly. Oh. Well, then, uh, then when? Just sometime before I die. Oh, awesome. 
Awesome. Well, I'm gonna head out, huh? Uh, see you next time. Tomorrow, yeah? Same time? Okay. Works for me. All right, all right, cool. Okay. We don't know how long Simeon had to wait. Could have been days or weeks, even years. But he waited. Huh, has he come yet? Has he come yet? Not yet. No. Ah. In waited. Got to be today, right? <laughs> so obviously, it's got to be today. I mean, you have waited forever. Maybe. And waited, even after so many other people had given up. Waiting for that long for something so important would have been difficult. I can only imagine what it felt like day after day, year after year, just waiting. But then, one day, the Holy Spirit led Simeon into the temple courtyard. It's him. It's him. Pardon me. Oh, yes? May I, uh, may I hold your precious child? Oh, uh, we don't even know of you. Of course. What's his name? His name is Jesus. Jesus. Lord, you are the king of all. Now let me, your servant, go in peace. That is what you promised. My eyes have seen your salvation. You have prepared it in the sight of all nations. It is a light to be given to the Gentiles. It will be the glory of your people, Israel. Simeon had seen the Messiah, our Savior, just like the Holy Spirit promised. It took a lot of waiting, but Jesus was worth the wait. Hmm. What I miss? Uh. The end. Let's give it up for the So and So Show players. Great story, Kellen. Yeah, waiting is hard. I know. I mean, think about how you feel the night before your birthday. Now add that with the night before Christmas and the night before the first day of school or vacation or anything really exciting. Then multiply that by a million, and you might come close to what it felt like to be one of God's people waiting for the Messiah to come. Simeon could have given up and lost patience, but he didn't. He knew he had the Holy Spirit with him, just like we know we have God with us, even while we're waiting. That's awesome. Thanks, Kellen. You bet. I'll see you guys next time, if you can wait that long. We'll do our best. Bye. You know, Simeon must have trusted God a whole lot because he had to wait a long time to see God's promise come true. And sure enough, God did come through in the end. And it just goes to show you that God always keeps his promises no matter what you have to wait for or how long. God is always with you, and you can trust him while you're waiting, just like Simeon did. In fact, you can trust God no matter what. Like when you have to wait for something little, like maybe your mom says, Honey, no snacks before dinner, or it'll be spoiled. Or maybe it's something big, like a new baby brother or sister. Well, no matter what it is, let's take time this week to thank God for this reminder that he's always with us and that he'll help us through those times when it's hard to wait. Thanks for joining us. See you next week.
welcome to week three in our series called The Story of the Bible. During this series, we are learning about how the Bible came together, uh, kind of in a historical sense, but the reality is that the Bible didn't come to the world how the Bible came to you and me, like this, all in one book. Uh, instead, the, the, the Bible, like, it, it came to us slowly. It came to us as a process. And so we're learning about that process. And, and I feel that knowing the story of, the, of how the Bible became the Bible, it can actually change our perspectives on the Bible. I think it's a lot easier for us to believe in the Bible if we know how the Bible came to be. So if you're joining us for the first time during this series today, that it might be valuable for you to go back and listen to weeks one or week two uh, or weeks one and two before uh, diving into this one. In week one, we talked about how the Bible wouldn't exist without Jesus. Jesus didn't write the Bible, but peop the people who did write the Bible, they wrote about Jesus and about what happened to him, and especially at the very beginning. At the very beginning of what we call the New Testament, there are four books. We call them Gospels. They are Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and uh, these are actually different people's accounts of what happened surrounding the life of Jesus, his ministry, his life, his birth, his death, and his resurrection. But without the resurrection, there would be no Bible. And that's kind of what we talked about the first week. And so resurrection is, is a focal point for us in our faith, but it is also the catalyst for how the Bible came to be. So, Last week, we went back to the beginning of the Bible, and we talked about the book of Genesis, because uh, around the time when, when Gentiles started believing in Jesus, when they started hearing about the name of Jesus, they, that what they did is they figured out that he was Jewish, and they went back and they started opening the Jewish scriptures. And, and of course, the, like most people, they started at the beginning, and they, and they got to Genesis, and they were floored in Genesis chapter 1 as they learned that uh, what the Jews believed was so very different than everything that they had believed. And so last week we talked about how, you know, the Jews from the very beginning only believed in one God. And they believed that this God was the creator of the world. And, and not only created the world, but created humanity. And when God created humanity, God created us in God's image. And in doing so, gave everybody dignity. So, and, and, but early Christians were blown away, especially the Gentiles, to learn about these things that the Hebrews, that the Jewish people had known all along. And that's kind of where we left off last week. But when we left off, right at the end, we, I mentioned the fact that when these Gentiles were discovering the Hebrew scriptures, that some conflict had started to arise. Because as the Gentiles were reading the Jewish Bible, and by the way, this is my Jewish Bible right here. Uh, it's called the Tanakh, uh, or the Holy Scriptures. Right up here says the Jewish Bible. There is no New Testament in this. You might think, oh, well, that's not that big of a book. It's pretty small. Let me tell you, the, the words are tiny in this. And so it's, it's just a small version of what we call the Old Testament, but what Jewish people call the Hebrew Bible. But when we left off last week, we were finding out that the Gentiles who were reading the Jewish scriptures, they had no intention, they, 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 didn't, they, they were interested in Jesus, they weren't interested in the history, they weren't interested in all of the great stuff that was in there. And so they were looking at the Hebrew Bible from their own unique, newly formed Christian perspective. And so as they were reading the Jewish scriptures, they had no desire to follow the Jewish religion. They had no desire. They were reading, you know, the Hebrew Bible, but they weren't looking for Hebrews. Their interest in the Jewish scriptures, it had nothing to do with the historical or the cultural revel relevance of the Jewish religion. And let me explain to you why. At this point in history, the temple had been destroyed. And we're at about the end of the first century. And so, and at this point, the temple in, in Jerusalem had been destroyed. And so the Jewish faith was kind of in this transition period. Uh, for, for years, they had, the, the, the temple was, was central to their worship and, and, and how they practiced their religion. But now they were moving into more of a rabbinic time. They were, they were moving into where people worshiped in synagogues. And 
it was just, it was very, very different. And so, and we'll learn a little bit more about the temple next week and how important it was to Jewish faith. But at this point, you know, all, all of the people that practiced Judaism, they were, they, were figuring, they were having to figure some new things out. So the Jewish faith was just starting into a new place. The second thing that was happening around this time was that from time to time, the Jews would side with the Roman Empire against the Christians. And you might be sitting there going, why in the world would they do that? Why in the world would they be, you know, against the Christians, you know, but with the Roman Empire? Last week, we talked a little bit about the relationship between the Jews and the Christians, or sorry, between the Christians and the Romans and the Jews and the Romans. And we found out that the Romans pretty much left the Jews to themselves, but they did not like the Christians. They didn't like the Christians because the Christians didn't believe in the pantheon of gods. And while the Jews didn't believe this either, they were a much older religion. But these Christians, as they were coming along, they were, they were causing a lot of trouble in the Roman Empire, and the Romans just did not like the Christians. And so as the Romans were finding out more about the Christians and their faith, they found out that they believed in this risen Jewish rabbi. And so all of a sudden their eyes turned to Judea and they go, Jewish? And so the Jews were quick to jump onto the side of the Romans and to continue persecuting the Christians. And so there's some conflict that's building in there. And, and, and the third thing that, that was happening around this time was that the Gentiles, they, they were picking up the Jewish scriptures, but they had no desire to become Jewish. They had no desire to understand what was going on in the Jewish scriptures in a religious standpoint. They picked up this book and they started looking for Jesus. And, and so as you can imagine, uh, the, you know, the, all the Jewish scholars, all the Jewish teachers, all the Jewish rabbis, all the Jewish leaders, you know, they would come and, 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 and they would hear what these Christians were, how they were interpreting their scriptures, and they did not like it at all. And so all of a sudden, there's all of this conflict set up between the Jews and the Christians. And so the church, the early church, they took this book, but they didn't take the religion. They took the book, but they didn't take the culture or the lifestyle of the Jewish people. And so Gentiles' interest in this book was not historical, and it was not cultural. Instead, their interest was Christological. Now, that is that, that, that where I'm from, we call that a $10 word right there because it's, it's got more than 10 letters. And, but what Christological means in a sense, and what we're talking about it now is, um, what you need to know is that when the Christian church grabbed the Jewish scriptures, they weren't looking for the history of the Jews. When, when, when they took over the Jewish Bible, they, they, they weren't looking for, for the Hebrews or, or how they interpreted the Bible at all. What, what they were looking for was Jesus. They were looking for the Christ. And as they started to do their own interpretation of these ancient texts, of this history, of this literature, the law and the prophets, they found Jesus everywhere in this book. And in fact, they found Jesus in so many places that they probably found Jesus in too many places. They, they started to interpret scriptures to, to make it more like Jesus when Jesus wasn't even a part of the story. And so this, this was happening all this time. And you can imagine how the Jewish leaders and the scholars, they felt about this. They were appalled. And this was something that Paul, the Apostle Paul, tried to warn the early Christians about. He saw this conflict arising between, you know, the, the, the church, which was full of, of former Jews and Gentiles, and the 
old Jewish faith. He, he saw this coming, and, and so he tried to warn in the book of Romans that this shouldn't be something that was happening. The book of Romans was written primarily to Gentiles, and in there, Paul starts to talk about how, you know, hey, the church is made up of both Jew and Gentile, but you need to be careful. You, you need to, to watch out because what's, what's happening here is there's this conflict that is happening, and you need to be careful because without the Jews, without the Jewish faith, without everything that had happened up until this point, there would be no Jesus. There would be no Messiah. So, the early Christians, they took these scriptures and they baptized them, they Christianized them, and they allegorized them, and they made them all about Jesus. And they rejected the Jewish interpretation of the Jews' own scriptures. Their basic thought was that, hey, you guys, you missed your own Messiah. You, you didn't see him. You rejected him. And, and there's all of this information about him in your own scriptures. And so we're going to interpret this our own way. But this brings me to kind of what I want to talk about today and into next week. I don't think it's good for us to still interpret this book that way. Because by rejecting the, the Jewish interpretation of these scriptures, what we're doing is we are forgetting about some of the most important parts of the Bible. And, and the way I like to look at this book, which is both the Old and the New Testament, is that this is one continuous story. But you have to understand the story within its own context. And so by taking the Jewish nature out of the Jewish texts, we do a huge disservice in the, how we interpret the Hebrew Bible. And so today and next week, what I really want to do is I want to give you kind of a high up view of the story that is in the Old Testament, because this part of the Bible, it's so much more than the preparation for Jesus. By understanding a bit about what's going on in the Hebrew Bible, we understand more about who God is. Because at its heart, the Jewish scriptures tell the story of how God created the world, but then worked at revealing himself to the entire world with a purpose. And that purpose was to have a relationship, to redeem, to save you, and to save me. And that story did not begin with Jesus. That story continued with Jesus. And so we need to understand the beginning of the story in order to better understand what was going on with Jesus. Jesus. So last week we started in the book of Genesis, but we really didn't get past the first chapter. In the first three chapters of Genesis, we read about how sin enters the world and how, you know, God created everything, but then the world is broken because of humanity's choice to reject God. And so as, as humanity rejects who God is, the world falls and the relationship between God and people is broken. But then we see something happen. God stops the work of creation, and, and, and at least the big work of creation, and God starts to put on the founder hat, is what I like to call, and God starts to found a way to influence humanity, to bring people back, and, and you'll see that God has a plan. And God has a plan in order to save all of mankind. And it starts with Abraham. Now, Abraham is called Father Abraham because he is the beginning of what would become the Jewish faith. And that Jewish faith would eventually give us Jesus, which would lead to the Christian faith. In fact, uh, there's a third world religion that also harkens back to Abraham, and they are you know, the Muslims. The Muslims also believe that they, they trace their lineages back to Abraham. So Abraham is Father Abraham. He's, you know, in charge, uh, or he was, he's been traced back to the beginning of three world religions. But when we meet Abraham in the, at, at first in the book of Genesis, he isn't the father to anyone. He's just a man with a wife who are both past their 
their prime and well past the family making age. It's not that they don't want kids, but they have never been able to conceive. And by the time the story picks up with God, they are over 80 years old. And they fully expect to never have children because it's just not possible. But Abraham is faithful to God. And through that faithfulness, God makes a huge promise to Abraham. Look at this promise in in Genesis 12. Uh, God says to Abraham, I will make you into a great nation, and I will bless you, and I will make your name great, and you will be a blessing, and I will bless those who bless you, and whoever curses you, I will curse. And and, and I want to focus in on this last part. And all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. All peoples, not just the Jewish people, not just Abraham's family, but all people. All peoples on earth will be blessed. So one of the things that you may not understand about the Jewish people, about the Jewish culture, about the Jewish faith, is that they were always called to be something special in the world. They always had a high calling that came straight from God, straight from this promise. They were to be a blessed people, but not so that they could just be God's prize like a trophy set up on a shelf so all the world could see. No, they were going to be blessed so that they could be a blessing to others. When Jesus said that we were to love one another or to love our neighbors, everyone thought that that was such a new and radical idea. But those that were really wise, they recognized that this was actually a very old idea. The whole idea of the Jewish nation, of the Jewish family, of, of, the, of, of the family of Abraham, was that they were to exist, to be a blessing to the people around them. And so God blessed the family of Abraham. And eventually the family gets bigger and bigger and bigger. And eventually they they become this huge family and they end up in Egypt as slaves. And at this point, God sends someone to save those who couldn't save themselves. And that person was Moses. The story of Moses is so powerful. God's people, the people that God, that carried the, that carried God's promise, you know, the ones that were to be blessed so that they could be a blessing. Well, they aren't being blessed right now. They are in a horrible situation, worse than any time at any point in their history. They are slaves to Pharaoh, and Pharaoh makes, there is, has been making their life hard and bitter. And so God raises up Moses, and Moses goes to Pharaoh and speaks to Pharaoh on behalf of God. This is our our first time that we get a prophet, someone who speaks for God. And so God speaks to Pharaoh in the only language that Pharaoh really understands, and that is the language of violence and the language of power. And finally, Pharaoh lets the Hebrews go, and they leave the land of Egypt. And as they leave, the Egyptians are so happy to see them go that they actually like give the Hebrews gold and, and jewelry and, and all of this stuff. And so it, it, they, they, they leave, but they leave while plundering Egypt. Moses leads the people away from Egypt, and they end up at our next section, which is Mount Sinai. And at Mount Sinai, God makes a covenant with the people. And it is there that this family, this extended family, this ginormous family, becomes a nation, becomes a people. But they can't just exist and be a people. God can't just bless them and leave them to their own devices. Remember, they've been slaves, and at this point, they've been slaves for 400 years. They did not know how to live. They did not know how to be a country. They did not know how to act. And so, their natural inclination was going to be to be like everyone else around them. But God did not want that. So, God made a covenant with them. And a covenant is like a contract. And in that contract... The people promised to obey the laws of God. And if they did, God would bless them. And so there were 
all these commandments that were given at Mount Sinai. We, we've all seen the movie where Moses comes down with the Ten Commandments, but there wasn't Ten Commandments. There were 613 commandments. And the people, they promised to follow the commandments of God. But this contract, it was totally like based on performance. And so in other words, the people had to come, had to do their end of the bargain. They had to follow these laws. And if, if they did follow these laws, the promise was that they would inherit the land, that they would be blessed, and that they would continue to live in the purposes that God had for them, that everybody would on earth would be blessed through them. That was their purpose. But they had to follow the law. And if they were to break the law, And if they were to look around them, if they were to start doing the things that the countries around them were doing, if they were to follow their gods, if they were to follow their practices, if they were to follow their culture, then God would allow those countries to come in and take over, you know, the land that was supposed to belong to the the Jewish people. And the Jewish people would get a heavy dose of what life was really like under those people's rules. And the idea was this would be punishment, punishment for breaking the law. And if they, if, but as they received their punishment, the hope was is they would come back to God, they would repent of what they had done, and then God would reestablish them. So the covenant was conditional, at least part of it. But the part of the covenant that wasn't conditional was the fact that these people were God's people, and they would be God's people forever. So now, you might be thinking to yourself, well, that's a lot of laws. And, and honestly, this is where a lot of people have start to have a problem with what's going on in the Old Testament. They, they get to those laws, they get to Leviticus, they get to Deuteronomy, and, 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 and they start reading the laws and their, their eyes glaze over and they go like, man, this is not what I'm all about. And, and what people assume is that they have to follow what's in here. But as Christians, we recognize that this is the Mosaic Covenant. This is the covenant that was made between God and the Jewish people. And unless you're of Jewish descent, you're a Gentile. Like, it has nothing. And if you're a Christian, there's only one law that you follow, and that is the law of Christ. And the law of Christ is love. Love one another. Love your neighbor. You know, follow in the footsteps of Jesus. That's what Christians are called to do. We don't forget what's in the law. We, we study the Old Testament. We, we believe that this is still inspired Scripture. But we also recognize that the Old Testament is not for us. Jesus is for us. Jesus is the fulfillment of the law. And Jesus teaches us the right way to live. And it is by his blood that we are saved. It is by the new covenant, what we call, that we are saved. And so, but I did want to talk about the law just a little bit. And and this is where I, I kind of want to end today. But because a lot of people, they read the law and they believe it's ridiculous. <laughs> and, and they go through there. And, and, and one of the ways that I want to illustrate this to you is by using a passage in Leviticus 18. Now, in Leviticus 18, um, Moses lays down about 19 or 20 laws, depending on how you count them, about sex. And right here, this is where our modern minds kicked in, kick in. And this is where, you know, oh, God doesn't need to be telling me how to do my business and, and who I should love and what I should do. But, there, but you need to pause for just a second when we're understanding this. And, and I wanted to talk about this for three diff- distinct reasons. One, when the pastor talks about sex, everybody kind of pays attention. So I got your attention now. Uh, number two, there's a really amazing lesson in this. For each and every one of us. So this, this is something that, that we can really pay attention to and that we should. And number three, this is one of the areas where we lose people. People think that, that this is something that they have to do, and they also misunderstand the context. 
One of the most important principles about this law is that we have to put this law into the context with which it was written. And you see, we live in a modern world. We live now, whereas these people live not hundreds of years ago, not decades ago, but thousands of years ago. The world was a very different place. And as you go through these 19 laws that deal with sex, you will find that most of them don't apply to us. And the reason for that is we have progressed as humanity. But what you need to understand is when these laws were written, when these laws were given to the people, every single one of these things were happening And they weren't just happening somewhere in the world. They were happening where the Jewish people were. They would have been familiar with these things happening in Egypt. They would have, been fami- they would have seen these things happening with the other people in Canaan where, where, where they lived. And, and so the other peoples that weren't Jewish that lived around them were doing all of these things. And the other thing that you need to realize is that these laws, like these aren't crazy kind of things, many of them. Like, for example, here's, here's the first one. No one is to approach any close relative to have sexual relations. And I think most of us would go, yeah, duh. You know, we, we know that that's bad. And here's the crazy thing. Here's the crazy thing about this whole thing. I told you there's about 19 laws in this one chapter that all have to do with sex. 17 out of 19 of the prohibitions in Leviticus 18 are either illegal or very much frowned upon pretty much everywhere in the modern world. 17 out of 19 of those laws, you would go, yeah, that's just right. That's just the way that it is. And so you got to think back into the ancient text. You got to put yourself not in our modern world, but in the ancient world. 19 out of 19 things were common in the world at the time. And God was calling the Jewish people to be different. God was calling his people to live a different kind of life, to live a holy life. And part of living that holy life was to not do these things. At this time, the reality is that the law for its day, for its time, was revolutionary, was ahead of its time, not by decades, but by centuries. You know, one of the things, like this law that I just showed you, no one is to approach their own close relatives to have sexual relations. The reason why that, you know, we, we know the reason why, but this was common practice. People would sleep with their family members, and, and it was just not a good practice, especially in royal lineages. This happened all the time. Brothers would marry sisters. There was a lot of inbreeding, it, and it led to some weird things and some bad things. Over a thousand years after the law was given, this practice was still happening in the Roman Empire around the time of Jesus. Think about that. It wouldn't be till centuries after Jesus that the practice of having close sexual relations with your family members would really fall out of practice, especially for those of royal descent. The Old Testament was so far ahead of its time. And so the lesson that I want us to take out of this is this. As we're reading the Old Testament, as we're reading the law, we need to take the law and put it into its context. And where people get into trouble is when they do this, when they take the law or the Bible and they take it outside of its context and they try to interpret ancient words for a modern context. And so a better way is to take those ancient words into their ancient context and then try to apply those lessons forward into our modern context. That's how many, many, many United Methodists do their own theological work. We read the scriptures in their contexts. We try to take the whole story 
and to account. And then we interpret that. One of the biggest lessons that we can learn about the Old Testament is that the law was radical and way ahead of its time. People were sacrificing their children to the gods. People were having relations with their mothers. People were having relations with animals. And and all sorts of awful things were going on. And the law called humanity to something better. God's laws were laid out in the Sinai Covenant. They were revolutionary for their time. And they were ahead of their time by thousands and thousands of years. Remember, these are God's people. And God's people are called to a higher standard of living. They are called because they have a purpose. And their purpose is to be blessed so that they could be a blessing. Echoes all the way back to Abraham. Blessed to be a blessing. There is so much more to this. And so I'm going to hit the pause button right there. And next week we're going to come back and we're going to learn more about the Hebrew Bible and our series the story of the Bible. So right now I have three questions for us to discuss at home. Uh, Question number one, has something in the Old Testament ever caused you to question or doubt the existence or the nature of God? Explain why. Question number two, if you grew up hearing Bible stories, have you ever encountered someone who tried to tidy up parts of the Old Testament? How do they do it? And why do you think that they did it? And then question number three, what do you think happens when we take the Old Testament law, these ancient scriptures, and apply it into today's modern world? What are the dangers of doing that? And is there a better way of understanding? That's all for me. Let me pray for us as as we end this time together and, and sing our way home. God, I pray right now for each and every person. I pray that a passion for the Bible would be renewed in all of us, would be ignited in all of us, that that we would come to understand that through the story of how the Bible came to be, that this book is inspired by you, and it is here to inspire us to great things. God, thank you so much for your love, for your grace, for your peace, God, for your plan that has been instituted since the beginning of the world. God, I pray for each and every person right now that is hurting, those of us that are feeling lost. God, may we find you in difficult times. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Would you join me in saying the Lord's Prayer? Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen.
Thanks for joining us, friends. Hope you enjoyed the service. If you have any questions about Waters Edge Church or have any prayer requests or want to contact us, go on to our website. All of our information is there, h2oedge.org, and we really hope to be able to see you either here in person or online next week. Have a great one. Bye-bye.